book of James. James chapter 1. Just after the book of Hebrews is the book of James, and in your Schofield Bible, page 1307. James chapter 1, we'll be reading just two verses. We'll read the verses in unison. The 26th and 27th verses of James chapter 1, page 1307. May we stand, please, for the reading of this passage. And you'll begin with me, please. Verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father, is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That 27th verse is the text verse, and may we pray. Father, thank you for this good day. Thank you for your word, and everything, of course, centers around your word. We believe it to be the truth, and we believe that we have an accurate record of it. We thank thee for it. We pray for your blessing upon the preaching and upon the preacher. Please open our hearts to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Every year about this time, <clears throat> I try to remember the poor in a sermon. My Bible says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I want to say something to you this morning, everybody looking right this way. More people backslide in the next month than all the other 11 months put together. Your mind this morning is on everything but preaching. Every kind of competition in the world is here this morning. But there's not a season of the year in which you need preaching as much as you need preaching now. I want to speak this morning on the subject how to keep unspotted from the world. Now follow me carefully and I'll teach you something. How to keep unspotted from the world. Our Father, bless our message this morning. May we give attention to the truth of God. As I give what I believe is what you, what you gave to me to give to my people today. Bless our hearts. Amen. I used to sit in a small office in a little country church and dream. I dreamed of someday preaching to great crowds in great auditoriums across America. I, like every young preacher, sat in my little study in the country church looking out the window you couldn't see but one house and there's a mile down the road. I used to dream of someday preaching behind the pulpits in the great churches of the world and the nation. I sat there in my study and looked through the door and saw the little auditorium that seated 150 people. And I dreamed, I dreamed that someday I'd pastor a great church with thousands of people. September 25th, next, I'll be 60 years of age. Every dream I ever had has been more than fulfilled. I have preached in those Colosseums. I have preached in the 15,000 seat Cobo Hall in Detroit. Seen that place packed and jammed several times. I have preached in the Edsel Ford Auditorium in Detroit. And seen the place overflowing numbers of times. And then the great convention center in Indianapolis. And the convention center 
10,000 seats in Dallas. And then the convention center in Atlanta, Georgia. The Coliseum at Rutgers University. Coliseum of the University of Colorado and Flagstaff with its 12,000 seats. University of Indiana Alumni Hall with its probably 15, 20,000 seats. Convention Center in Baltimore, Maryland. Coliseum in San Antonio, Texas. North Texas State University Field House. Coliseum in Bangor, Maine. And those are just a few of the places where this little country preacher has gotten to preach. My dreams are fulfilled. I dreamed of preaching in the great churches of the world and the nation. And there's not a great soul winning church in America where I have not preached. I preached in great churches of the past in years gone by. I'm talking about the Jarvis Street Baptist Church in Toronto where the very famous T.T. T. Shields pastored for over 40 years. I'm talking about the People's Church in Toronto, where Dr. Oswald Smith pastored for so many years. Back in its heyday, I'd go there almost every year. I'm talking about the Moody Church in Chicago many years ago. I'm talking about the Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga and its giant auditorium. I've preached in most of the great churches of our generation. My dream has been fulfilled. And then my dream of pastoring someday a great church. For over a quarter of a century I've stood on this corner preaching what I believe is the greatest church that's ever existed since the church at Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. What's left? I can truthfully say this morning, I don't know of anything I want. I do not know of a single material thing that I'd like to have. They don't make the car I'd walk to the back door to get. One of our men bought for me and paid cash for me $30,000 Mercedes Benz. Called me out the front and said, Preacher, it's yours. I turned it down. I said, it's a Rolls Royce for nothing. I don't want it. I don't want it. He said to me, but Pastor, this thing's got every kind of gadget in the world. I said, all the gadget I want, I got in my hand right here, right now. I have no need. But he said, Preacher... You just push a little button, and right here, it locks all four doors. Well, I said, you push this one right here, it locks one door, and you can't get out of but one. On a church mail wagon, I drive around. But he said, you push this little button, and all the windows go down. I said, don't need to go down. It's air conditioned in the summertime and heated in the wintertime. You don't need the window down unless you chew the back up. They don't make the car. I'd walk to the door to get I have more suits of clothes than I can wear. And the truth is, I can only wear one. But I am... I... Uh, uh, people buy me clothes and decorate me like a Christmas tree. And as you can see, I'm always handsome. Some of the time. Handsome. One time I was. Um... What's left? As I look back on my life, and I, I guess maybe, I, when you get my age, you look back more than you did. As I look back on my life, Doc, the great times that I've enjoyed in my life have not been speaking to 15,000 people in Cobo Hall. In fact, I don't remember much about it. And great meetings... All over this nation, I don't remember much of that. The things that I dreamed would make me happy have faded. 
the things I remember the most are the times I've helped somebody. A poor bus kid who needed a pair of shoes. Or a widow who had no coat. Or a couple with a broken heart. Or a lonely one. I want to speak on that subject this morning. Jesus said, through the Holy Spirit inspiring James, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and the fatherless in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Let me paraphrase that, and let me tell you what the average Christian thinks that means. By the way, seven times religion is mentioned in the Bible. Only one time is it mentioned good. You see, the answer for America is not religion, the answer for America is Jesus. See, there's nothing the devil would like for us to do anymore than to get our attention off Jesus on religion. The world loves religion. And the devil loves religion. In fact, he started most of them. And, uh, but, but there's nothing he'd rather us do than to get religious and get inoculated from a good old dose of salvation through Jesus Christ. But here's what the average person thinks this verse says. Pure religion is wrapped up in three things. One, visiting the widows. Two, visiting the orphans. Three, keeping yourself unspotted from the world. And that is not what this teaches. God is not saying here that pure religion is visiting the... By the way, the word visit here doesn't mean go see. The, I'm gonna, the word visit means to inspect, care for, and oversee. To inspect, care for, and and oversee the widows and the orphans. Now, follow me carefully. Here's the message. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit or to care for, inspect, and oversee the widows and the fatherless in their affliction. Now, follow me. In order to keep himself unspotted from the world. God is not saying here that pure religion is visiting the widows, visiting the orphans, and being clean. God is saying, if you want to be clean, the way you are clean is by visiting and caring for the widows and orphans. That's what he's saying. Like we say, wash and be clean. That's just one thing. You wash and you get clean. He said, visit the widows and orphans and care for them, and you'll keep yourself unspotted from the world. It's all one thing. Like we say, uh, we say, straighten up and behave yourself. That's not two things. That's one thing. We're emphasizing again. This is the way that you behave yourself or straighten up, you behave yourself. Or we say, open your eyes and see. Open your eyes and look. Now, you open your eyes, you're going to look. You can't help but that. And uh, it's one thing. Now, what God is saying here, God is saying to us that pure religion is this. Visiting, inspecting caring for and overseeing the needs of the poor people, the widows, the fatherless, which represents all the spectrum of poor people. And he says, in so doing, you will keep yourself unspotted from the world. You keep flowing into the sea, and the sea will never flow into you. What he's saying is this. He's saying, wash. I'm sorry, he's saying, if you want to be washed and be clean, he said the best way to do it is to visit and care for the widows and the orphans. And in doing that, you keep yourself unspotted. Now, I mean this. I think most of here, us here want to be unspotted. By the way, it doesn't say here uh, to be, not to be uh, saturated or bathed. It's saying unspotted. God said, I don't want a spot on you. I don't want, I don't want, one, I don't want one martini in you. I don't want one immoral night in your life. I don't want one curse word to flow out of your mouth. 
I, I unspotted. Didn't say unsaturated. Unspotted. Now, he says this. We, 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 and I, think, I think most of us in this room this morning want to be unspotted from the world. Yet we adopt the wrong method of doing so. Now, follow me carefully. We say, I shall run away from the world and be unspotted by it. We say, I shall resist the world and be unspotted by it. We say, I shall spend my life trying not to do wrong and be unspotted. But the very trying not to do wrong is thinking of wrong, and thinking of wrong will lead to wrong. Hey, try to diet next week. Say, I am going next week not to eat. Try it. And every day say, I will not eat, I will not eat, I will not eat, I will not eat. And you'll say, I just ate. Because your mind is on the food. And God is saying here, He is saying, if you want to be unspotted from the world, He said you don't get that way by saying, I'll stay away from it. I'll resist and reform. I'll spend my life trying not to do wrong. I must guard myself. No, sir. That's good, but that's not the best. The best, this, the best way in the world not to be unspotted by the world is get up close to the world and help it. That's what he's saying. He's saying, go help it. Didn't say go join it, go help it. Didn't say go do what they do. <clears throat> said go help it. See, you go to feed its hungry, and that will keep you unspotted from the world. You go to lift up its fallen, and that will keep you unspotted from the world. You go to clothe its cold, and that will keep you unspotted from the world. You go to pity its downcast, and encourage its discouraged. And you get close to the world, not to do what it does, not to fellowship with it, but to help it. And the Bible says that's the way you keep yourself unspotted from the world. The one who gets the farthest away from the sinner is the one who shall soon share his sin. The one who comes to the fallen and says, My brother, my heart bleeds for you, is more likely to be unspotted. They say, for example, that doctors and nurses often build up an, an uh, immunity and are the last to catch the epidemic. Why? Because the doctor is trying to keep folks well. We have some doctors here this morning. Uh, numbers of you fellows will, will, will vouch for this, I'm sure. That uh, the doctor uh, will probably, because he's helping folks stay well, he's the least likely one to catch the disease. Why? Because he is working to help the disease and the way to, to keep from the disease, in his case, is to help people get well. He who lifts the alcoholic will less likely drink. You see, folks, you get up close to this world and, and catch its tears, and you'll see how rotten it is. I recall several years ago when our daughters were in Howells Anderson College, our two youngest daughters, Linda and Cindy. Doc, uh, it's easy to make rules that everybody's got to work on a bus route. But when it, your daughter's over there in South Chicago visiting, it's a whole new ball game. In fact, I almost wrote myself a letter complaining about it. But time and time again, listen to me, look at me, time and time again, I have realized on a Saturday afternoon that Linda and Cindy were over there in one of the most dangerous parts of Chicago. And many a time, I have prayed for their safety. And yet, I would not have taken them from there for anything. Why? Because the best way for those girls to stay pure and clean and not go in the world is get a real glimpse of what the world is really like at the end. And so they went and they lifted up the fallen and tried to win people to Jesus and saw, caught the tears of unwed mothers. Did you hear what, what they said last week? Almost half of the babies born in Chicago last year were born out of wedlock. I think they said 75%, wasn't it, of the black ones? And 20% uh, of the white ones? Almost half! What an indictment! And yet, and yet, 
Uh, we go ahead and we're alarmed at that. And these self-styled pseudo-psychologists tell us what the answer is. The answer is we need to get back to that. That's the answer. But now, listen. If you really want to stay clean and unspotted from the world, Church of Jesus Christ, get off your padded pews and get out there where the world lives. Somebody needs to tell every single one of those uh, uh, 50% of the mothers, uh, the ladies who became mothers last year in Chicago uh, were not married. Somebody needs to go to every one of those and tell them, we've heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Where sin doth abound, grace does much more abound. But you're too busy decorating your Christmas tree. You're too busy going Christmas shopping. You're too busy with your own affluence. You're too busy buying and selling and eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. You're too busy stacking it up and you're too busy having your parties and having your fun while a whole area goes unloved and goes uh, plunging toward hell without God, without hope, without Christ, and in many cases without food or without anybody to care. You know, I'll tell you who the cleanest kids in Howells Anderson College are, Dr. Evans. The cleanest kids in Howells Anderson College are these kids who are out there yesterday soul winning in the ghettos. Cleanest young ladies in Howells Anderson College are not those that wrap their phylacteries around them and say, I wouldn't touch a sinner with a ten foot pole. But the cleanest ladies in Howells Anderson College are those who yesterday out in the bad weather were going up and down the streets of Chicago trying to reach out to little boys and girls that need somebody to care and buy a little pair of shoes to put on some cold feet and a little coat to put on a body. Listen, I wouldn't give you a dime. I wouldn't give you a dime for Christianity that doesn't consider the poor. All over this world this morning, all over this nation, and especially this pharisaical God-forsaken religion in Chicago. We are gathering in our churches and singing our Gloria Patres and singing our anthems and having our formal worship services and sevenfold amens. And yet, uh, in a neighborhood, an uh, area perishes without hope, without love, without God, without anybody that much cares. I'll tell you who the clean young men are in Howells Anderson College. Those young men that get out there the closest to the world and see what the world is really like. I don't mean go out and participate and have fun in the world. I'm talking about go down to the skid row and pass out gospel tracts and get some poor fallen fella and, uh, and, and tell him that Jesus loves him and tell him that there's a hope and he doesn't have to stay in the quagmire of sin. I'll tell you who drives the most carefully. The fellow who pulls the dead bodies from the wrecks. I'll tell you who, li who lifts the alcoholic is the one who will drink the less, less liquor. The one who fights the fires is the one to be more careful about matches and smoking. I thank God this morning. I thank God that when I was a youngster, I was put with those who needed help. I thank God that every Sunday afternoon at Hillcrest Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, Somebody got a bunch of us young people and took us over to Terrell, Texas, 30 miles west, east of Dallas. That's where the state insane asylum was. We went over there every Sunday afternoon, conducted services at the insane asylum. We saw the end of sin. We saw the sin, when it is finished, bring us forth death. We saw a wage of sin is death. We saw your sin will find you out. And we saw and that institution heartbroken people. Every Sunday afternoon we'd go over and I can recall as a teenage boy, 16, 17 years of age, I'd come back home weeping, thinking of those people. I thank God when I was a youngster in college, every Tuesday night I drove to Tyler, Texas, about 40 miles from where I went to college. There was a um, tuberculosis sanatorium. Back in those days now, tuberculosis, it was, was you, you, you got it. You just, uh, there's no cure for it. And people just died like that with it. But every Tuesday night, 
We drove over to the tuberculosis sanatorium, and I'd go from ward to ward there, preaching to about 30 people in each ward. I'd go to one ward, take about 15 minutes, and I'd preach, and I'd tell them that Jesus loves them. And I remember how I'd go to the wards, and I'd preach, and, and the next week I'd go back to the same ward, and there'd be a bed empty, and I'd say, what happened to that person that say died since you were here? And I said, bless God, that person received Christ last, last, last Tuesday night. Oh, listen, I thank God that God didn't make me a reverend. I thank God God didn't make me a high church, gown wearing, collar wearing, reverend. I thank God as a youngster. I found out the way to stay clean is to help the sinner. Jesus said, do you want us to stay unspotted in the world? He said, then visit the widow and the fatherless in their affliction, and in that will keep you unspotted from the world. I thank God. When I was a young preacher in college, uh, and I won't go into the story. You've heard it too many times already, but I've, I've, um, I went out in the country trying to find somebody to hear me preach. I had no place to preach. I had no church to pastor, and I wanted to preach. Good night. I, feel, I, I, I sort of feel these fellows that haven't got preach inside of them. And uh, I went out in the country. And I tried to find somebody to let me preach. And I, I, I'd find an old church building on a Thursday night. I'd find an old church building and I'd sweep it out. And I'd go out and get my car, 41 Dodge, and drive up down the country roads and stop everybody I could. And say, I'm going to preach down there in an hour. Want to come to hear me? I won't take an offering. And uh, I'd, uh, we will take an offering tonight and every service here. Won't take an offering. And I'd go out and they could come and the poor folks would come and I'd get in that little old empty building, sometimes a Grange Hall building or sometimes a borrowed barn and sometimes an old dilapidated church building. And I'd stand up there and I'd preach to a little crowd of people, sometimes 15, sometimes 20, poor, common people. And uh, I thank God for that night. That night, well, that day I was driving out uh, Middle Roseboro Springs Road. I saw a little little white church building. And I stopped and I said, hello, hello. Now that's ringing the doorbell down East Texas. Hello, hello. And I heard this, this old voice say, yes, sir. Hello, hello, yes, sir. Looked up and there was a black fella coming out. And I said, my name is Jack Hiles. He said, my name is Mr. Bussy. I'm Deacon Bussy. And I said, Deacon Bussy, do you have church here? And he said on Sunday, yes, sir. He said, I'm not criticizing them. We all speak that way in Texas. And uh, yes, sir. Uh, said, Reverend Roseborough from the Bishop Cottage come out on the Lord's Day and preaches for us. I said, you have preaching here on Sunday night? Yes, sir. Reverend Roseborough returns on Sunday night. Have preaching on Wednesday night? Yes, no, no, sir, sir. No preaching on Wednesday night. Reverend Roseborough teaches Bible at Bishop College on Wednesday night. I said, would you ask Reverend Roseborough if you okay if I borrowed his building on Wednesday night? He said, yes, I'd, I'd be glad to do it. And I borrowed that building every Wednesday night for, for months and months. I drove out there. And uh, all the folks with the color of these folks here on the front, sweet as could be. And uh, uh, the children were a lot better looking than these here on the second row. But uh, I, uh, I remember I'd, I'd drive out there on Wednesday night. And it'd be, oh, 40, 50, 60 people there waiting for me. But they had kerosene lamps and lanterns, and so they didn't have the lights on. Well, colored folks in the dark are not there. And uh, so uh, I'd, I'd, I'd walk up and I'd say, hello! Well, the kerosene lamps and lanterns weren't on yet because it was not, uh, we were going to stay for a while. We stayed 11, 13, 12 o'clock every week. And you don't mean that. And, uh, but uh, uh, I, I remember I'd, I'd say, hello! And, and, and I'd say, hello. Every one of them would turn around and look at me. Looked like there's 40 people there. Looked like 80 headlights in, in, in the dark. And uh, the eyes looking at me. I'd count the eyes and divide by two and figure out what the crowd was. And I remember I'd preach, and oh, oh, how happy they'd be. And I remember how they'd shout and how they'd praise the Lord. And I remember how they didn't have much money. And their houses were just usually made out of little boxes, maybe little, maybe, maybe an apple cart, crates or something. And uh, they didn't have cars. They came in wagons and horseback. But they loved God. And my heart went out to them. Listen, as I look back over my life, I don't remember too much what happened at the great Coliseums, but I remember what happened in that little country church down in East Texas, those little black people I preached to, down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. I picked up my paper the other day, and I said, Who in the name of heaven is going to help these thousands of women, young women in Chicago that have babies and no husbands? 
And the tragedy is, most of them don't know any better. We put them on welfare so they could buy a closed circuit television, and and we we've, we've uh, piped adultery into their living rooms and said, "This is the way Hollywood lives." And we've made heroes and heroines out of a bunch of whores and uh, and uh, and heathen. They don't know any better. Who's going to help? By the way, I said, "Oh God, who's going to help those little babies?" Most of you are not. You couldn't give a flip. You don't much care. You hear about that. Oh, what's happening to America? You. The prophet Jeremiah stood on the street corner of the, of the city and he said, Is it nothing to you? Oh, you passed by. And I said this morning, Is it nothing to you that half of the babies born in Chicago this year don't have daddies? Who's going to reach them? Hope every one of them come to First Baptist Church Hammond. You saw those little old sinners coming here. Yeah, we'll trade a dozen of them for you Pharisees, one of you Pharisees any day. Yeah, they'd glad to. Yeah. Rich fellow said to me 26 years ago when I first came here, what are we going to do with all those old dirty bus kids running around here? And I said, I'm going to love them. I don't know what you're going to do. He said, I want you to know if they stay, I go. <laughs> what a deal. They stayed and he went. Yeah. I'm not interested in pastoring a bunch of fat, sassy Pharisees. I'm interested in pastoring a church with a heart. A church that loves the down and outer. And by the way, I'll guarantee you that you take you take the churches in America that have the convictions are also the churches that are going out in the world and preaching the gospel and getting close to the sinners and taking care of the needy. That's the same one. Why? Because Jesus said, if pure, he said, pure religion before God and the Father is this. Visit the poor, visit the widows, visit the fathers, visit the orphan. And in so doing, you'll keep yourself unspotted from the world. May I say this, and I've never told this in anybody. But every year when I go back to Texas, I rent a car. And early I go to Live Oak Street. And I go to what used to be the Hunt Saloon. The same spot where it used to be. Where my daddy used to hang out and serve at the bar and where he used to get drunk. And as long as the Hunt Saloon was open, I went to that. As long as it is closed, I'd go there at the same spot. But I'd go back in that saloon as long as it's open every year. I'd take me a big stack of gospel tracts and I'd walk up. And I'd say to the fellow behind the bar, Read this, it'll show you how to go to heaven. And I always remember the day I walked in there on New Year's Eve. And my daddy was drunk at the bar. And I said, Daddy, I want you to, you're going to go with me and I want to preach to you tomorrow. Sunday was on New Year's Day that year. My daddy was sitting at the bar drunk. And he said, I'm not going to go in there preaching. And I said, you, you, you're twice as big as I am and twice as strong. But I want to fight you to get you out of this bar. If you don't want to fight your own son in this tavern, that saloon, then uh, you come with me. I took my daddy out of the saloon, sobered him up, took him down to East Texas, preached to him the next day, never got him saved. But I go back to the same place every year. Most every city I go to in America, I find a rest home. I have visited literally hundreds of rest homes all across this nation. You know why? Because my mama's there. The little lady is like my mama. This is a sin-cursed area. Everybody in this church ought to make themselves drive down the streets of Chicago and the ghettos about once every week. Make yourself do it. And nobody cares. And every once in a while, we'll get a letter from some Pharisee, church of Pharisees over in the ghetto area, and they'll say, we don't like your buses running by our church. In fact, we voted as a church ten to nothing. Who cares? We care. And as long as I'm my name's on the letterhead of this church, we're going to keep on caring. 
And that's the way you stay unspotted. You wonder why our kids get spotted? They don't get out there where the world is. I'm not talking about going into the world to have fun. I'm talking about going in the world to help. Lift up the fallen. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Encourage the discouraged. Lift up the poor. I'll say this and I'll close. That's really all I think is left for me. I have no place I want to go. I used to dream of traveling. I used to wonder what Rome was like with the Colosseum. What was Paris like? I used to wonder what, what London was like with the Tower of London, Westminster Abbey. I used to wonder what it was like in Tokyo. I used to wonder what the pyramids looked like and what the Sphinx was like. I used to wonder how it'd be to stand at the place where Jesus was crucified and saying on a hill far away is there an old rugged cross. But I've been there now. I've been everywhere I want to go. There's no place left. I want to go anywhere else. I don't I get invitations every week of my life to preach all this country. I got an invitation this week to go to Australia, preach at a convention, I won't go. Invitations to go all over the world. I don't go. I don't want to go. Why? I, I, my dreams are all fulfilled. I have no desire to preach in the great churches anymore. I've been there. I preach every year and have for years now at the Great Southwide Baptist Fellowship. Preach a closing message on Tuesday night last year, year before last year, before that. I've been invited to preach a closing message on Tuesday night again this year, uh, next year. Uh, I, that, that's good, but I just, just let me have somebody that needs help. Just, uh, just let the next person come in the office. Let the next little lady come with her little children and say, Brother Howes, is there any way they can go to Christian school? They don't have a daddy. Let the next one come in and just let me try to figure out some way to pay their tuition. Let the next little boy come in that's run off from home and his mom and daddy are scared to death where he is. Let him come in. And let me have 30 minutes with him and see if I can help him. Let me see if I can get him back with his parents. Just let me have the next little lady comes in whose husband's left her. Let me have a chance to talk to him and see if I can get him back together. Let me have the next one come in who's tried to commit suicide and see if I can give him a reason to live. That's a dream. All the others have been fulfilled. That's my dream. Won't you share it with me? Won't you dedicate yourself in this Christmas season to seeing to it that nobody goes unloved in this great area? Won't you sacrifice something in this Christmas season? So somebody can be helped. Look at your clothes this morning. Look how nice they are. You'll go out after a while and get in a car that's enclosed, has a heater in it. You'll go home to a house or an apartment that has a heater. You'll wear shoes that have no holes in the bottom, most of us. you have a coat maybe a, uh, on your back and a hat on your head. Ladies and gentlemen, within 15 miles of where I stand this morning, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people Who never hear I love you. Who never do. And they need somebody to care. And in caring for them. And in feeding them. And clothing them. And encouraging them. A wonderful byproduct. Is that you keep yourself. Unspotted. From the world. That is not. You then. Become involved. In what our Savior called pure religion. She lived in Texas. She was about 75 at the time. She came for a visit to Chicago, to Hammond. My mama did. One day I was going out soul winning and I said, Mama, go with me soul winning. 
she said, okay, I will. So we went soul winning. First house we visited was a family named Allmiller. We won Mrs. Allmiller to Jesus. Then the next house we visited is out in Columbia Center. Walked in, little, little, little mother was there in a poor little modest place in poverty. There was a little baby bed there. And a little child looked like she must be seven, eight, nine, ten years of age. And she had a, like, like this, and she, she looked up out of the bed, and she tried to smile. And my mama began to cry because my mama had a little child like that when she was young. And I wonder later to Jesus that mama had a spell. And then we went and saw a little girl in a wheelchair, a 17-year-old girl in a wheelchair. We'll never walk again. We want her to Jesus. Then we went over here in Indiana Harbor, scenic spot of the world, the Palm Beach of the North, Indiana Harbor. And there's a, an address there, and we went to, looked at, and the address was a tavern. Well, I went up and I said, Mrs. Gonzalez, no, Rodriguez live here? And uh, they said, well, she was around the back, in a little apartment around the back. Well, then I went around the back, Mrs. Rodriguez was there. She said, oh, how nice she was. Oh, Father, come in, Father. That's me. <laughs> and uh, come in, come in, Father. Come in, Father. Oh, Father, come in. I went in. My mother came in. Mama started telling her I wasn't a father. I said, shut up, Mama, don't hush. Back behind that tavern, I told that little lady about Jesus, and she got on her knees. And they will forget it. I started to leave. And she said, Father, bless me again. I'd never blessed anybody before. I guessed at what you did. I put my hands on her head and said, I'll watch how much you're you me. And uh, I, uh, she said, bless me again, Father. I blessed her again. Blessed her again. I'm the best blesser in this town. I blessed her again. And oh, she was happy. We got in the car and Mama was crying. And I said, Mama, what's wrong? She said, nothing's wrong. She said, this has been a wonderful afternoon. And then my mother said, you know what I think, son? I said, what, Mama? She said, I think that where we went today and what we did is exactly what the Savior would have done if he had been in Hammond today. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's why I'm here. That's what it's all about. You know, my mom and I didn't have a drink all afternoon. Mama didn't say one curse word all afternoon. We didn't read one Playboy magazine all afternoon. You know why? Because pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the widows and the fatherless and their affliction. And in so doing, you'll keep yourself unspotted from the world. Our Heavenly Father.